Good evening, everyone. I am really glad to be here with you again for another episode of Live Well Sister. Actually, this is our second one this week, which is not the norm, but everything is in divine order because on Monday we were talking about money and how to manage money and how to maximize our money. And today we're talking about how we make our money and some of the ways in which the spaces that we are doing so can not always be positive and you know have also have solutions and ways that things can get better so i am your girl marcy thomas founder of brown girl collective and it is indeed an honor to be here with you again so as you come on in the room as i like to say mimicking tabitha brown please feel free to share this out if you just have questions about the workplace or things that you want to share so tonight's special guest is Adia Harvey Wingfield, who is a leading sociologist and a celebrated author who researches racial and gender inequality in professional occupations. Dr. Wingfield is the Mary Tileston Hemingway Professor of Arts and Sciences and Vice Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity at Washington University in St. Louis. She served as president of Sociologists for Women in Society and the Southern Sociological Society. Her book, Flatlining Grace, Work and Healthcare in the New Economy, won the 2019 C. Wright Mills Award from the Society for the Study of Social Problems. And she writes regularly for mainstream outlets, including Slate, The Atlantic, and Vox. Of course, she lives in St. Louis, Missouri, when she where she works. And we tonight we're going to be talking about her book, Gray Areas: How the Way We Work Perpetuates Racism and What We Can Do to Fix It, which is actually not out yet. So this is your opportunity to go ahead and pre-order because it'll be out on October 17th. So with all of those wonderful things to share about Dr. Wingfield, with no further delay, let's go ahead and welcome her to Live Well Sister. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, and I am excited to have you here. As I mentioned offline, I have family members that, that are Wingfield, so we're going to have to figure out if there's a connection somewhere. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yes, so first of all, I just want to congratulate you on your forthcoming book. Of course, it's not the first one for you, but you know, congratulations nevertheless, because I know it's no small feat to put out the, a, a book of this magnitude and all the work and everything that went into it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yes, yes. So before we like really get into the book itself, I just have a really quick question for those who might be interested in the type of work that you do. So what is it that drew you to want to be a sociologist and a sociologist who focuses on the workplace? Wow, what great questions to start off with. Um, I actually have a long history of being interested in sociology. I was very fortunate to take a high school class in sociology, which is actually pretty uncommon. But that class was like a light coming on in a dark room. I felt so excited and so interested in the opportunity to think about different groups and how different groups were affected at that level, rather than just thinking about the ways that individuals were affected. And really when I took that class, there was no looking back. I knew that I had found my intellectual home, so to speak. And in terms of how that impacted my wanting to study uh, race and gender in the workplace. That actually came later when I was a graduate student at Johns Hopkins University. I took a class on women in work, and it was the same type of experience that I had in high school of really being motivated to 
think more about these questions of why women are disproportionately represented in occupations where they often are paid less and what that means for Black women who tend to earn less than white women and Asian American women. Why that happens? What can we do about it? And what types of questions can we ask to understand better why those disparities persist? Yes, and it's so, such important work because I know every year, usually it's around July, August time frame, is Black Women's Equal Pay Day, and you know we discover how much over the course of a of a year, and then even over the course of you know a lifetime of work, how much we don't make, unfortunately, yep. the average Black woman, I should say, does not make in relation to what other people are making. So but that work and really diving into that and in ways that we can hopefully begin to make a change is very, very important work. So I appreciate what you do immensely. Thank you. So with great areas, it's about work and racism. And oftentimes when we think of work and racism, we can think about, you know, first thing that comes to mind is like, you know, maybe the microaggressions or macroaggressions or some people just say aggressions mm -hmm. <laughs> that we deal with in the workplace. And we know that that can be a part of it. But what your book does is dive into things that go even beyond that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So my goal with gray areas was to think about the parts of work that we don't spend quite as much time thinking about, the more intangible aspects that are part of work but aren't necessarily embedded in doing your job. So how we find work through our networks and our connections and relationships with people, the type of organizational culture that organizations develop, and how often those organizational cultures aren't built with Black people in mind and don't take into consideration Black workers' experiences and the opportunities that exist for advancement and moving up in a company and how often, again, those interact, the uh, expectations and opportunities for advancement really rely on the relationships that people have and not necessarily exclusively on their merits or the work that they bring to a company. So yeah, I think we do have a lot of discussion about uh, microaggressions and macroaggressions, and that's certainly very important and a big part of what a lot of Black workers experience. But the ways that race is present in workplaces and the ways that the way the ways that we work uh, contribute to racial inequality are a lot bigger than microaggressions or macroaggressions. And that's what I wanted to talk about in the book. Right. Right. And, you know, as I told you before, when we came on, there were things in the book that triggered me because just <laughs> not, you know, just from experiences that, that either I have had or things that I've watched, you know, other people go through in workplaces that you know, a lot of times the people who are are doing the things are oblivious to what it is that they're even doing. Right. It's just a part of, as you said, the culture or, you know, I, even deeper than that, sometimes just the systems. Mm -hmm. um, because, well, let's talk a little bit about just historically Black people in work historically in this mm -hmm. country that kind of lends itself to where we're going um, in gray areas. Yeah, that is an interesting aspect to me as a sociologist to think about how race and work have been so intertwined through the history of this country uh, since its inception, right? We obviously know that slavery has been a core part of the Black American story uh, because of the centrality that it had in shaping Black Americans' early years in the United States. But I don't know if we often think about how slavery and the relationship that it developed for how Black people were construed as workers who didn't deserve pay, who could not uh, see any economic gain from the fruits of their labor, that really set a significant foundation for shaping who was worthy of what type of work and who wasn't worthy of not only certain types of work, but even, again, being paid for the work that was right. done. And what we saw later in the post-slavery era was that work continued to remain a dividing line along racial lines, that Black people were still prohibited from having access to jobs that would have been well and this isn't an accident. This is embedded in public policy decisions, in right. uh, legislation that occurred in the post-slavery period. Up until today in the civil rights and post-civil rights era, where we still see race, where we still see work um, and ideas around work closely tied to ideas around who belongs in certain jobs, who doesn't belong in certain jobs, and what assumptions become present around people who break those barriers and move into jobs that aren't seen as the ones that they're construed as best suited for. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what makes it so important. And to have that historical context, you know, because as I was reading and even beyond, I was just thinking like, wow, these things are, it really is a system. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's systematic. And that's right. why it's important for us to have these types of discussions so we can, uh, as Iana would say, call a thing a thing. <laughs> <laughs> And begin to do, you know, work within those systems or, or you know, legislative things of that nature to make, bring about change. Yeah. So as you mentioned even earlier on, there are really a couple of things that go on. Of course, we know we have the requirements of the job, which could be, you know, whatever your education is or, you know, or whatever skill sets that you need to have. And that's one part of your ability to do a job. But then there are three other things that also can impact that work. Right. And when I talk about those other areas, the gray areas of work, I think about, again, the social parts of work that have an impact on how racial inequality is perpetuated. I talk about this specifically in terms of hiring and how we come to jobs, about organizational culture and how we uh, navigate that aspect of work, the fitting in and the assimilation or lack thereof in a job. And again, the hiring and the upward mobility and the types of relationships that are necessary for having some opportunity for moving ahead in a job in the first place. Right. And it's something because, you know, wh when I read things, I always come up with, you know, or remember, recall things that I might have seen. And just the whole thing of qualifications. We often hear as Black people that you got to have twice as much, work twice as hard. You know, you got to have a master's degree that somebody else can walk into, you know, with a you know, high school diploma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And they're still your boss, even though you have the, the higher degree. But one of the things, I'm going to start with cultural, um, the cultural aspect, because there are each job or each type of company, each company has its own type of culture. And a lot of times those things that are happening culturally within that uh, place of work will impact the way that we as Black people are able to navigate in those spaces. So when you say culture, what do you mean by that? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I talk about culture, I'm talking about what I call and what a lot of academics refer to as the organizational culture. And basically mm -hmm. that means the norms, the values, the taken for granted aspects of how people interact in a particular organization. So we might think of one company having an organizational culture that's very laid back and very informal. People come to work in jeans and maybe they don't have specific office spaces because there's an open floor plan and everyone's encouraged to work together. Uh, and maybe in that particular office space, the culture is that everyone should see themselves as family and see themselves as people who really have close ties to one another. That could be one example of an organizational culture. But then on the other hand, you might have a more formal organizational culture. And the idea of coming to work in jeans could be completely anathema. It just would be unheard of because the right. culture is one where people are expected to wear suits and ties or business suits or things like that. Perhaps everyone has an office in that type of organizational culture and people aren't necessarily expected to feel as if they are friends or family, but perhaps it's a very hierarchical structure where there's a lot of emphasis on uh, people who, where people fall in rankings and getting things done and following rules and specifically adhering to established uh, rules and expectations that are already set. So there's some variety in terms of what organizational culture can look like, but I did also find in the book that there are also some consistent factors in a lot of organizations in terms of their culture that can create some difficulties for black workers. Right, right. And one of the things that I love, if you if you had a chance to read the description for the for the conversation in the book, you even though you interview a lot of people over a course of time, as you dive into these different concepts, there is a group of I want to say seven for seven mm -hmm. people yep. that you actually focus on that are in different career fields. So it's not just, you know, one person or one career field. So we can see how these things kind of play out, um, you know, in these different people's career trajectories. So um, just like in one of the stories, it's, well, you, it's called clan culture. Yeah. So that clan culture is the one that is where we're all kind of together and we are, you know, we are a family, you know, <laughs> type of thing. But sometimes as black people, we may not fit in. And I know, and there was a young lady who, one of the, I can't, forgive me, because I'm not going to remember everybody's <laughs> names, but the one of the people that you 
feature in that area is a young woman who was working in a space where she was like the only yep. black woman in this quote unquote family environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of the real, I mean, all the, I, I personally found all these stories super interesting, obviously, but uh, the person you're thinking of is Constance and Constance was really important for me to include because she worked in this environment that I described and she described as a clan culture, this idea that workers were supposed to come together and make decisions as a group and they were supposed to feel tied together and feel some connections. But we also wanna note that Constance was employed in the STEM field where we know that black women are significantly underrepresented. And in Constance's particular field, black women are only about 5% of the workers in that field across the board. So they're very underrepresented in that profession. Right. And what that meant for Constance was that she really faced a lot of challenges dealing with the organizational culture in her workplace because there was such a push for people to want to come together and work collaboratively and feel as if they could be part of this group and part of this family. But for Constance, being so isolated and being so marginalized really took a toll on her. And being in that clan culture felt really difficult for her because her colleagues often were very oblivious to the types of racial challenges that she faced. The difficulties finding collaborators, the people who, I won't say shun, that's a strong word, but people who didn't really speak to her very much or interact with her. Colleagues that she would see offsite outside of the workplace who would completely ignore her when they bumped into her outside of the, the office. That stuff is hard to right. deal with and to try to navigate. And so for Constance, being in this environment where there's an expectation to be part of the family, when at the same time your family members <laughs> aren't right, speaking to you and right. working with you on projects created a lot of difficulty for her in navigating that space and doing the best work that she possibly could. Right. Yes. And that's just one of the, you know, examples with a lot of times, you know, she was in STEM, but in other environments, you might find a person might find themselves in the situation, you know, and what I thought about it's like, I've experienced in jobs like, you know, let's say there's a new movie that comes out and it might be Gabrielle Union in the movie. And I'm like, I'm excited about the movie. Go to work on Monday and be like, oh, yeah, I saw this great movie over the weekend with Gabrielle Union. And people are like, who is that? Who is that? <laughs> Exactly. And that was exactly one of the experiences that she talked about, about being out with a group of women from her department and uh, an old rock and roll song from the 80s coming on and everyone really vibing. Oh, remember this song? And her saying, no, I don't remember this song because when I was coming up, music and culture was very segregated and it still is today. This isn't going to be a song that I know. The songs that I know might be very different songs than the ones that you're familiar with. But this just goes back to this feeling of isolation that was really paramount for her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the others, because we're not going to get through all, because the point yes. is for you all to buy the book and read it. <laughs> but um, one of the others that stood out to me is the gentleman who worked in finance yeah. and he was moving around in different uh, organizations. But because he had a different type of background, he didn't personal background. He didn't necessarily feel some of the discomfort or, you know, being left out the ways that maybe other Black people might feel. So I found that very interesting as well. Yeah, that person is Darren that you're thinking of. And I, mm -hmm. I like Darren's story because it presents a narrative of someone who has really had a successful career. And I think it's important to highlight that, right? I didn't want to write a book where, <laughs> you know, right. by the end, people are like, man, I shouldn't have picked up this one. I'm bummed out and she's made me miserable. And it is important to highlight that there are ways that certain Black people will have experiences that highlight their upward mobility and their ascension within certain firms. But what I think is also really critical to underscore for Darren's story is that some of that had to do with his own initiative and his own comfort in these spaces and his own background and coming from an environment where navigating these types of predominantly white environments was somewhat second nature. But a lot of it also had to do with the company and some specific decisions that the company made to try to tackle these issues of race and racial diversity head on and not to shy away from them and to put into place programming and initiatives that have been documented and shown to have some success in improving racial diversity all throughout the organizational levels. And so for Darren, I really like thinking about his experience of organizational culture in contrast to some of the other ones that I highlight in the book, because it does show that there are ways that we can think as people in organizations about how to structure them differently and how to think about them differently in ways that could potentially meet more, match the opportunities more for Black workers.
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the last one I'm gonna bring up in that last story in that particular section um, is the the Max. See, I remember that name. Yes. <laughs> Who is a physician, and just yeah. some of the things that he went through as a physician because we think that you know doctors are at the you know top of the totem pole so to speak you know so people are saving lives and all these sorts of things which he is definitely doing but that there are things that he's facing in his work culture even as a person that's at sort of the top of the chain so to speak yeah i love that narrative from max because it's it's so interesting and so telling and he's another example of a success story but one that we want to know and understand more about and i say that because when max talked to me about his background he grew up in very humble beginnings he was wasn't as super smart and had a lot of opportunities and i think even he would say was very fortunate in some of the opportunities that he had but also worked really hard to get to where he was so went to college medical school found a position he's this emergency medicine doctor and in healthcare as i learned from my previous book healthcare is a very hierarchical field and the Mm -hmm. company where he worked the hospital where he worked uh like others in healthcare was very hierarchically structured so in that framework you would think someone like max He's got it made. He's the doctor. People listen to him. They defer to him. They take what he says very seriously. But Max never was able to forget that he was a black doctor. And that was really critical because even as the doctor, he'd still have experiences where patients said racial slurs openly to his face. He still had experiences where patients would say that they wouldn't allow him to treat them and that they would wait for a white doctor, even if it meant going back out in the waiting room and waiting for another five, six, seven hours. And so I think it's really important to include Max's story because it shows us that even for Black workers who are at the, what we would think of as the top of a hierarchy, the Black workers who are really highly placed, who are in charge, who are running things, we still want to underscore that getting to that position doesn't mean that you somehow escape many of these challenges, but it also shows how important it is not to be the only one in that position. And for Max, a big part of what offered him support was knowing that he had other friends and other colleagues who really understood what he was going through and could provide a necessary comfort when he dealt with challenges like what I've described. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for that. Um, just sharing just those little snippets. So this gives everybody an idea of what they'll see. So it's not, it, the book is a very good read. It, you know, even though you are an academic, it's a book that anybody and everybody can read. It's not like or it's so far over your head that you're like, oh, it's too deep. <laughs> Stories are, are what make it very interesting. But really, it, it just in that whole, to kind of sum up what that section of the book is about, it's really your focusing on or or talking about situations where different organizations are doing diversity badly basically <laughs> where we say you know we're diverse we you know we bring everybody in we want you to be a part of the team rah rah you know we you know everybody's here to do all these great things but they don't pay attention or even consider the ways that maybe the culture might not embrace the things that black people are dealing with right exactly Yeah. So, and along that line, it makes me also think about the fact that, and this has happened since you wrote the book, the changes with like affirmative action, because a lot of times, you know, our culture, the culture in many workplaces has been, you know, Senator, okay, there's affirmative action. So we're going to hire these people or whatever the case may be to bring the diversity in. But now that's been done away with. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 certainly very troubling, right? As far as I am aware, the Supreme Court decision prohibits it prohibits affirmative action in making decisions at the college and educational level. It does not, in my understanding, preclude any consideration of uh, race at all when we're talking about private companies and employers. Although that's not to say that that isn't forthcoming, yes. because it probably is. But what I think is most troublesome about that decision is how many companies immediately responded by proactively or preemptively uh, pulling back their diversity initiatives Mm -hmm. and retreating from from this front. And that's concerning to me because it makes me wonder what companies plan to do without plans in place to make sure that they are building diverse workforces and that they are not only building these diverse workforces, but establishing, like we've talked about, a culture and an environment where the workers that they do hire can thrive and succeed and really do well. 
if the outcome of this uh, legal decision is that companies do away with policies and practices that don't work, that's one thing if they move towards the ones that do. But if companies make the decision that they're just not going to do anything because it's too fraught of an environment and they don't know what's safe, so they'll just pull back. I just don't see how that bodes well for an increasingly multiracial democracy where people of color are an increasing part of the population and black workers are a core part of the labor market and a core part of the workforce. Right. And, and, you know, ignoring the fact that affirmative action did more for white women than it did for anybody. Yes. We don't <laughs> often always talk about that, but it's very true. <laughs> that is very much supported by the data. Right. So it's like, okay, so, you know, you're hurting your own, you're hurting your own, so to speak, by making mm -hmm. these sorts of, of changes. So I just found that that really interesting. So the next piece in the book that you really dive into is the social aspect and even how we get the jobs, mm -hmm. you know, because we've heard things about, you know, you you send in your resume and I mean, let's just call it what it is. You know, if your name looks too black or whatever the case may be, you might automatically get, you know, pushed to the side. But the fact that there are a lot of different ways that that people are finding work nowadays that different from what it was 20 or 30 years ago, and that there, there is a social aspect to being able to even find work. Mm -hmm. Right. That when we look back at how work has evolved, it's really interesting how much getting jobs has changed and how the practice of getting jobs has changed significantly just over the 20th century and the 21st century. One of the things that I make a note of in the book is that it used to be that you would have classified ads in newspapers and you might see help wanted signs posted in stores. And it wasn't completely uncommon for people to land jobs cold that way and to just walk into places and to be able to put their credentials out there and to be hired. Now, to be fair, that was not the case for everybody. We've always had pretty significant systemic racial discrimination in this country when it comes to hiring. But we did have more of an open market, so to speak, where there were more opportunities for people to access jobs cold. And what we know today from the research and data is that that is really not the case. A majority of people find jobs because of connections and relationships that they have. But we also know that significant hiring discrimination still happens in the labor market and that Black workers are often weeded out early on when their names do come across recruiters' desks, or they are not included in the relationships and the networks that lead people into certain jobs in the first place. And so what I really wanted to do with the second section was to think about how the workers in my study got jobs in the first place and how, whether and how they were able to leverage the relationships that they had to move into the positions that they held and what complications were present there. Right. And even you have a story in that regard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you yeah. that at your current position. Yep, exactly. I mean, that was activated by my own networks. I knew some, my, I had a, a family member who knew someone who worked here at WashU and contacted him to say, uh, she's really interested. Can you tell me more about the position? And I know that that was a factor in my getting on the hiring committee's screen and getting in there, getting on their radar in the first place. Mm -hmm. So those things do do matter. I mean, like even finding out about the opportunities right. and things like that. Because as I was telling you offline, I know that you know of, of someone that I a, a company that I used to work for. Now I didn't. I don't know if I said it earlier or not, but I'm on the outskirts of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So you know, of course, Atlanta is very diverse. You know, a huge black population. Not just black. You have you know people from India. You have a lot of different. Um, people from like Mexico, you know, just it's very, very culturally diverse. Yep. However, now I had a job, a position in the corporate office, but one of the things that always puzzled me is that when it was time to hire other people for the corporate office that had, you know, either mid to upper levels, you know, C-suite um, positions, they were never people that reflected the diversity of what Atlanta is. Right. Right. And it always bothered me because it's like, okay, like what is going on here? <laughs> like you're in Atlanta. I mean, you've got like three major HBCUs right there if you're looking for educated people, you know, and then not to mention just all the other folks that are here. And but you can't find black people to even interview. Right. Right. That's a great point. I'm glad you bring up the example of Atlanta because that helps to underscore some of the fallacy of the pipeline argument. I think we often hear people say, well, 
we'd like to hire people from this group, but there's just a pipeline. There aren't qualified candidates and there aren't qualified applicants. But if you look at the disparity between the representation of where people are and where they end up being concentrated, it's often not accurate that there is a pipeline issue and that there are not qualified people to be available to be hired. And there's data that documents if we're talking about, I don't, I don't necessarily want to single out any fields, but there, if we think about business, for example, there is data that documents that there are actually a growing number of Black workers who are getting business degrees. Uh, and there's data that also documents that even Black workers from some of the top business schools in the country are more likely to be passed over than their white counterparts. And you can't make an argument that right. these are unqualified people. They are coming out of some of the top business schools in the country. So your example is really prescient in the way that it highlights how we often make assumptions about who can fit for a job and who's good for a job and where the lack of workers are. But that's not always necessarily grounded in reality. Right, right. You know, it was definitely a network of people, you know, even, you know, whoever it was that they were using to help, you know, determine who they were going to even look at didn't reflect, you know, what's actually in this community. Where at the same token, there were like what would be considered um, factory jobs that yes. you go in there and it's highly black, you know, it's right. predominantly <laughs> black and Hispanic there. But when but the moving up, but well, that's in the next section, but the moving up, the higher levels, you weren't seeing us. Right. So, you know, that definitely plays a factor of what opportunities are even there, who's finding out about those opportunities. And something that you also mentioned that even in a case where um, someone may know Black people, doesn't mean they're going to recommend them. Right, exactly. And that's another point that comes out of the data in this area that, Black and white workers are likely to activate their networks at the same levels and at the same rates. But where we see the breakdown is when it comes to people, the returns that they get on activating their networks. Both groups will activate their networks to the same degree, but white workers see much more of a return on their networks than do black workers. Mm -hmm. Something um, personally I was thinking about the other day, I am a member of a sorority, Sigma Gamma Rho. <laughs> And how a lot of, I didn't join until I was a graduate, but one of the things a lot of times people will talk about, oh, you know, join a sorority or, you know, join certain organizations that, you know, it'll be good for networking and all these sorts of things, which they can be, but then there's still a limitation to what they can do. And what, and actually um, someone in your book is in like predominant, went to, uh, I want to say FAMU, was it? Mm -hmm. A lot of the people that they knew were also Black people that are doing well in their careers, but that doesn't necessarily always translate into them being able to go into other workspaces where um, they might not have all of the authority for hiring. Exactly. And that was Kevin's story, who talked about uh, being in these environments that you would think would position one really well. He, as you mentioned, had a college degree, had gotten his own MBA from a prestigious university, and he had spent some time working in the financial industry, but then decided to make a turn and move into education. And he really found himself stymied in the educational field uh, because of the perceptions that people had about where he fit and where he belonged. And when I talked with him about the process through which he got the job that he had, he told me that Honestly, it's been older Black women who have been checking for me, and they've been the ones who have referred me. They've been the ones who have seen uh, opportunities that I've been good for, who have seen potential, who've seen maybe not even potential, but just that I'd be a really good fit for this certain position and that I have the qualifications and the skills. And he was very blunt and direct that he's never in his experience had white colleagues, friends, acquaintances, people that he knows who have helped him with getting employment. It has all been uh, Black people that he's known socially or through his HBCU experiences or what have you. And that's important to point out also because it highlights, again, just how segregated networks often are and the limited utility that that can have for Black workers. If Black workers are only relying on or only able to rely on other Black people to position them for work, that can mean the difference between getting in the door or not getting in the door. But given how often Black workers are underrepresented in so many of these companies, it can also mean that the number of areas, a number of companies that, where you have an opportunity to get in the door might be relatively slim, and particularly compared to white colleagues who are able, as I mentioned, to activate a much broader array of networks and connections. Mm -hmm. 
And it also, and actually talk about it a little bit in this section as well as the last, but like who's like who's advocating for you, who's, you know, going to put in a good word for you. You know, and sometimes if you have that right person that's gonna, you know, give you what you need or put in, you know, put in a word that it's great, but if for whatever reason you you don't have that, that sometimes it's not always gonna work. Right, right, exactly. And that takes me back to Constance's story again, where she was a person who, as a student, particularly completing her graduate degree, was very well networked to the extent that she didn't even realize how well networked she was until she lost that network. Uh, and she talked about uh, being connected to a very well placed and very well known faculty advisor whose connections and whose name really did a lot for her landing her, her position until she landed that position and basically uh, had to start over from scratch building new networks because it was a bit distinct from the area where she had been trained. And so she talks about how all of the credit she had went nowhere and it disappeared almost overnight. So her challenge became building these networks again. And again, building these networks again in a STEM field where black women are significantly underrepresented, but there's still a lot of emphasis on connections, networks, relationships, collaborations, and just hitting wall after wall and trying to do that. And it really was a challenge for her because it meant that she did not, after she landed this job, have the types of connections and networks that really mattered. And it had it it it, it took it really took a toll on her ability to uh fully fit into and thrive in her workplace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I have to backtrack just a little bit, just because in the book, and I set it up front, and you mentioned it as well, that in each one of these sections, you not only talk about some of the the different things that we might be dealing with, but you do offer some solutions. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's and that that is a good thing because we don't want it to be like oh it's just bad it's not gonna get better it never can get better <laughs> you know we don't want to just you know accept that it is what it is oh you can't see what my shirt says because it's backwards but it says proudly serving in the war on injustice so nice. <laughs> so you know this is the war on injustice in our workplaces as well so I do love the fact that you offer some solutions or ways that, you know, organizations that people who sit in those limited DEI seats that are still out there, <laughs> ways, and even as colleagues, how, how people can begin to work towards making a change. And I think, you know, in the social piece, as well as in the cultural piece that we have already talked about, being able to have um, People will say allies and other people will say co-conspirators. <laughs> people that are really going to step up and 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 be able to have these conversations and not be afraid to have these conversations. Yeah, I mean, that's it's just it's so critical, again, especially for black workers and jobs where they are underrepresented and they are the only one or one of a teeny tiny handful in their position. The isolation that I found from many black workers in that and that who had that experience was really it was it was really profound and it was really impactful to hear so many people talk about the extent to which they dealt with these challenges on their own or internalized them or kept them to themselves or that I was the first person who'd asked them about these and so they were telling all of these stories for for the first time so it really makes a difference when people are in workplaces where they feel as if like you said there are allies there are people who want to see them win who want to support them who want to offer them mentoring sponsorship guidance camaraderie that can really make the difference in these gray areas from making work a really difficult isolating, alienating place where it's hard to get ahead, it's hard to make connections to a place where people feel as if they genuinely belong and that there are opportunities for them to survive, not just survive, but opportunities for them to thrive as well. Absolutely. Because, you know, oftentimes we'll hear about, you know, climbing the ladder and, you know, you see people, you see certain people that are, you know, really successful in their careers, you know, and, but we don't always know what it took for them to get to where they are. Right. You know, what might be going on behind the scenes. Right. Right. And that's a real area where if you think about just your everyday, not just people who were in DEI positions and who are DEI managers, but your everyday coworkers, uh, that's a real opportunity for everyday people to make a difference, to offer that kind of support, to be people who are allies, to speak
coworkers of color and their black coworkers specifically. Right, right. And, you know, I don't know, just to even be, what should I say, hold, hold people accountable for even having a little more sensitivity about mm -hmm. certain things that are happening. Because oftentimes, you know, as Black people, things are going on in the world around us that really do impact the way ways in which we even feel stepping into the workplace. You know, there's whatever's happening at the work, at, jo at the job, and then there's whatever's happening outside of the job that impacts what's going on with us when we go to work. And so that's where I think, you know, some of these systems that we can begin to change or policies that can be put into place in organizations to be, to not be colorblind, right? You talk about that as well, but to really acknowledge the fact that there are people who have different experiences and that they can't just turn that off when they go and punch in the, punch the clock. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's critical. And I think that's a really important part of how modern workplaces can think about changing the culture and people in those workplaces can think about changing the culture to be more attuned to the very racially demographic, excuse, racially diverse demographics that we have in our workforce. Because you're right. I think that we're starting to become more attuned to this concept of bringing your whole self to work. This idea that people have to come to work as complete people and that we're not just people who uh, can exclusively focus only on work for eight hours or whatever, and that we don't have personalities or backgrounds or histories or what have you. But if we are talking about bringing your self, whole self to work, that has to mean that for Black workers, we have to be honest and cognizant of the fact that Part of bringing that self to work for Black workers is going to mean experiences with discrimination and inequality inside and outside of the, the workplace. One of the stories that I didn't include in this book, but I had in an earlier draft of it as I was thinking through it, was my own experiences with hearing about so many examples of police violence and police shootings and having to come to work after that. Like, it's right. not on my mind and go downstairs and teach my classes. Like, that's not a thing that I'm really grappling with and weighing. And I think part of how organizations can be mindful of what it means to really be diverse places is to understand that being diverse means that Black workers aren't just going to fit into a cookie cutter mold. They are going to have experiences that are different and reflect the realities of race in this country, but that it's okay for organizations to be attuned to that. It is okay for coworkers to be attuned to that. And to your point about how to be supportive, it's perfectly okay just to say, Hey, are you okay? Uh, right. How's everything? Are you are you all right? And to give people the opportunity to know that they are seen and valued. Right. That that is that is so important. You know, not that you can't. If something happened, let's say it happened over the weekend, and it's all throughout the news, and and you go to work on Monday, and everybody's around the water cooler talking about the game, or talking about you know other stuff, and you know you're on the inside, and you have to try to you know tamp down the fact that you're you know you're hurting because something has happened. Yeah. in the world that impacts people that look like you and folks just, you know, move on like, eh, you know, right. so how was the game, Bob? Right. You know, it's just like, <laughs> you know, just to be, you know, sensitive to things like that. And then, you know, just thinking about, of course, we all know what happened in 2020 and how there was a lot of performative types of things that were done in terms of putting out statements and, you know, black dots on social media and, you know, letting people, you know, doing IG takeovers. We let a couple of black people do an IG takeover or Instagram takeover and, you know, to talk about culture and race and all that. And in that moment, in that time, but number one, a lot of it was performative. Number two, how quickly did we forget about all that? And now it seems like we're going in the total opposite direction. Yeah, I mean, it's to, it's completely true. Some of the most telling things about that now, three years later, have been how many companies uh, either reversed or didn't continue their support for the diversity initiatives that they talked about in 2020. I think one of the most visible examples of that is how we've seen the cutting or declining of positions devoted to diversity, equity, and inclusion in many industries. That's 
pretty significant when, as you mentioned, three years ago, people were very explicit about their opposition to systemic racism and very open about their commitments to wanting to address it and wanting to acknowledge and try to fight and combat it. That commitment did not last very long, and it certainly did not last long enough to reverse the centuries of systemic inequality that we have seen in the United States over its its long history. Uh, and the other point that I would add about that is just that it's also it's it's telling to see how this reversal has happened, but it's also not completely unexpected. I think when we think about American history, and again we take the long view, a big part of American racial progress has been coupled with back backlash and backsliding. And I think that we've seen this in every historical moment where there has been a significant marked movement towards racial equity. We saw this after the Civil War and Reconstruction and the backsliding that happened after that. We saw this after the Civil Rights Movement when we ushered in this era where uh, prison industrial complex became much more pronounced and when it came to work, opportunities for work became much more scarce and diminished in areas where Black people were predominant and concentrated. So this isn't totally shocking, I think, to see companies moving in in this direction, uh, even despite their promises of a few years prior. Right. And a political climate, which we're not going to get into that today, because <laughs> <laughs> we know that plays a factor as well. Yeah. So the, one of the last or in the last section of the book, you talk about our relationships and basically it, it, the subtitle, who's got your back? Because, I mean, yes, there is a, you know, there is a corporate culture and whatever's happening there. You know, there's the opportunity to get the jobs and, you know, how social networking and all those things play into that. But then it, once you actually get in the seat, who's got your back once you get into the seat? Right. And that's a really critical question to ask because so much of the data shows us that when it comes to Black workers, we see so much of hitting a glass ceiling and so much leveling out at mid-level jobs. Black workers, and I open the section with an overview of just how underrepresented Black workers are in leadership positions in industry after industry, whether we are talking about finance, tech, government, academia, where I work. It, I don't know if it's possible to point to an industry where we see representative parity of black workers in leadership in that industry across the board. You might be able to find an organization or two, and even that I think is a tall order. But when we look at industries, we do not see black workers represented in, a, we do not see black workers represented in leadership in ways that reflect their population in the broader society. So you have to ask some questions, right? Why is that the case? And I think there are a couple of options. You could try to make a case that we don't see black workers represented in leadership because somehow across the board, black workers just don't have the skills, talent, interests, ambition to move into leadership roles. You can make that argument, but it would not be supported by the data because everywhere you look at data, it does show that black workers do have qualifications. They do have the skills. They do have the interest. They do have the ambition to move into those leadership roles. So with that hypothesis not supported by the data, I think the only other conclusion that you can draw is that there are systemic processes that are making it disproportionately unlikely for black workers to move into those leadership roles. And that's what I really wanted to dig into in that section. How do we advance in jobs? What are the processes of advancement look like? Are they solely based on merit and skill? Spoiler, no. <laughs> or are they also very heavily driven by the connections that we have, the relationships that we have, the extent to which we're on a manager's radar, the extent to which a manager feels as if we look like managerial caliber and look like someone who should be in a supervisory role. All those things play a, fact, play a role and are a factor in advancement, and they all play a role in the advancement of the Black workers that I studied for this book in different ways. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. You know, like, and we already touched on it briefly, like having a mentor, having a sponsor, having people that are going to advocate for you that will kind of help you move along, you know, and not, you know, not some quote unquote savior, so to speak, but just someone who really sees who you are, is willing to, you know, say your name in, in rooms where your name needs to be said, you know, someone is going to do those sorts of things. And that is important. But I think, well, here's a question. I know that sometimes it can be a challenge to find that though. So, you know, in terms of solutions, 
is there anything that like we can do as workers to kind of help us in that regard without compromising who we are as people? <laughs> yeah, that yeah, that that's a great question. So when it comes to people who are everyday workers, how do you develop the relationships that are necessary for mobility and advancement, I think is, is what you're asking me. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a couple of answers. I think from the worker standpoint, so for one thing, as a sociologist, I think about things at the group level and I think about institutions and organizations, right? So I'm reluctant to suggest that individual solutions and that one person should kind of take this work on themselves or people should make it only their responsibility. But I do think that collectively in organizations, if workers push for the types of initiatives and programming that help form these relationships, that matters a lot, right? So for example, some colleagues of mine in sociology have shown that having formal mentorship programs that are open to everybody can be really critical for improving the numbers of Black workers in leadership roles. And the reason for that is that when we leave mentoring opportunities up to people's whims and interests and their personal proclivity, proclivities, a lot of times people want to mentor people who look like them because they assume that there's going to be more common ground. Unsurprisingly, this means that for many Black workers, they get left out. But when there are formal mentoring programs where anybody can join, you don't have to be selected by a manager or HR, you don't have to uh, pass any sort of test or criteria to get in, it's just based on your interest. What they found is that Black workers, one, signed up in disproportionately large numbers, and two, those mentoring relationships meant that people who were in upper level positions were more attuned to their skills and more likely to want to work with and support them because they had a firsthand window into their abilities, into the things that they could bring to the table. So I think people People in regular everyday positions can push for programs like that, formal mentoring programs, so that everybody has an opportunity to benefit from relationships with people who are higher in the organization. And I will say on the other side, people who are in leadership roles should also right. be really open to and cognizant of and intentional about sponsoring and working with Black coworkers, not only because they are more likely to be overlooked, but because, again, this is a way to actively take a stake in creating workplaces that are more reflective of America and look more like the labor market and the demographics that we have in this country. And I just can't stress enough how critical and important I think that is going to have to be uh, as the country, if the country is going to continue to progress and move forward. If we're going to be a country where we are racially diverse, then we I don't see how we flourish as a country if we're still relegating significant numbers of workers to opportunities that don't lead to advancement and mobility. I I love that. I love that response. And I really meant for is that for you know systems because the reality of it is, yes, you know, unfortunately where I am right now is not an issue, but you know, in my let's just say in my old situation, yes, you know, I personally can go and do whatever and talk to. And there were times that I did advocate for myself in that space. But you know, that only helps me. It doesn't help a broader range of people. So I do think that it is important, you know, for people to kind of stand up and ask the questions to, you know, to put it out there, come together collectively and begin to, you know, seek solutions because we're not going away. And, you know, we want really it in all honesty, this is my opinion, but it's just better for everybody. It's better for the company. It's better for the organization where people can come to work and and feel good about where they are, feel good about what they're doing, to not have to worry about if something does, you know, is said or done, it isn't right that they don't have someone who's going to step up or, you know, speak out on, on their behalf. I just think it makes such a difference or you can go with your natural hair you know mine is wrapped up right now <laughs> but you know whatever the case i mean because even this is a thing you know there right. are people who might be you know who might have religious practices where they do have to have their head covered right. you know to be in, to be in a place where they can walk in and have their head covered and not be mistreated or told you can't wear that and those sorts of things which you know it's the crown act which many of us are familiar with our hair and you know things like that Right. It's, 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 it's critical. All those things are, are so important. I, I saw a study, I think about a year ago, that found that racism and racial discrimination wastes over a trillion dollars wow. when we actually sit down and measure it. So 
this is it. Like we're not we're not winning by having our systems and our companies and our organizations set up like this. Collectively as a society, we lose financially, we lose in human capital, we lose in our ability to benefit from everybody being able to contribute fully to the society that we all live in. And I think that helps to make the case for why these types of interventions are so important and so necessary. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, it's definitely important. So of course, I know you've got, we've just got five minutes left, believe it or not. <laughs> but of course, gray areas will be in stores in a couple of weeks. So in, in the process of the book coming out, are there any particular events or anything like that that you'll be doing, you know, besides this one this evening that are coming up that maybe people can continue to follow and find out more about your work in addition to buying the book, buy the book. <laughs> yes, definitely. Please, please do. It will come out October 17th. I hope people will buy it wherever they buy books and it, it's available anywhere books are sold. Please leave a review once you've had a chance to take a look at it. Um, and I think my social media information is at the, the bottom and I plan to update with my uh, event schedule there once I have more information about what exactly is happening when. So if you are interested in following me on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn, I'll be posting about my upcoming opportunities to talk more about gray areas. Yes, and it is so important, so important. And gray areas, gray areas. I know, I know there's a lot of meaning behind that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's black, there's white, and then there's shades. Exactly. You get it. You get it. That was actually my thinking. <laughs> right, 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 right. My mother always says, you're a smart girl. Yep. <laughs> I figured that out. So I really did, did appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you tonight, Dr. Wingfield. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you too. Yes, yeah, it's been such a pleasure to have this conversation. And everyone, I do really suggest that you get a hold of this book. And especially if you are like an HR person or a DEI person or, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, pick up a copy of the book, or if you work in a workplace, you know, maybe buy it and slide it under the door <laughs> for the DEI person so that they can like really think about it because, you know, these things are important. And as we said at the top, you know, it's stuff that oftentimes just doesn't get looked at or people don't think about, or we have certain conversations that we have and this conversation is not the one that's always had. So I just think it's so important that we begin to look at it and, and you know, advocate for ourselves and ask that our organizations begin to do the right things by us. So absolutely, absolutely. So if you could just hold on for me, don't hang up just yet. Okay. <laughs> I want to go ahead and bid everyone else to do. <laughs> and then, you know, I look forward to talking to you again real soon. Just hold on for me one sure. second. All right, everyone. Thank you for being here for that wonderful conversation with Dr. Adia Harvey Wingfield. I just love saying Wingfield because that was my late grandmother's last name. So it was a pleasure to meet someone else who had the same last name. So um, as you know, we are usually here on Wednesday evenings at, with wonderful conversations just about things that help us to live well, to live our best lives, you know, to really be able to not only think about our self-care and things like that, which is important. Um, sometimes the conversations aren't light and fluffy because if we're going to get to a space of really living well, sometimes we have to, you know, dig in the mud and then crawl our way out of the mud to be able to really live the lives that we want. So next week, we are going in a different direction though. It's gonna be a little bit lighter next week. So next week, I am really excited that we will be talking about For the Culture with Clancy Miller. And For the Culture is Phenomenal Black Women and Femmes in Food. So we will be talking about Black women who are chefs or, or really making a mark in the food and beverage industry. Um, this book is very, you know, has very beautiful illustrations in it that talk about different women, both past and present. They are trying to find a good uh, recipe. There are recipes in here, so I'm sure I'm going to find some things to cook. Like, look at this wonderful looking salad. 
that looks good. So, but uh, Clancy Miller will be here with us next week to talk about this book and just the the, the strides that women, black women spe and femmes specifically, are making in the world of food and beverage industry. Which actually we didn't talk about it. <laughs> I see. I see Dr. Wingfield nodding in the background, but this is another industry where we are often underrepresented. So this is going to be a really good conversation. I'm looking forward to it, and I hope that you will join me again next week. So until then, everybody, please take really good care of yourselves, continue to live well, and I'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.